Gaza. An inquest into its martyrdom by Professor Norman G. Finkelstein audiobook presented by the Learner's Library Part 2. The Goldstone Report. Chapter 5 A Zionist Bears Witness. Chapter 6 The Star Witness Recants Martyrdom. Part 2. The Goldstone Report. Chapter 5. A Zionist Bears Witness. In April 2009, the President of the UN Human Rights Council appointed a fact-finding mission to investigate all violations of international human rights law and international humanitarian law during Operation Cast Lead. Richard Goldstone, ex-judge of the Constitutional Court of South Africa and ex-prosecutor of the International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, was named head of the mission. Its original mandate was to scrutinize only Israeli violations of human rights during caste lead, but Goldstone conditioned his acceptance of the job on broadening the mandate to include violations on all sides. The council president invited Goldstone to write the mandate himself, which he proceeded to do, and which the president then accepted. It was very difficult to refuse, a mandate that I'd written for myself, Goldstone later observed. Still, Israel refused to cooperate with the mission on the grounds that it was biased. In September 2009, the long-awaited report of the Goldstone mission was released. It proved to be a searing indictment not just of caste lead but also of the ongoing Israeli occupation. The Goldstone Report found that much of the devastation Israel inflicted during caste lead was premeditated. It also found that the operation was anchored in a military doctrine that views disproportionate destruction and creating maximum disruption in the lives of many people as a legitimate means to achieve military and political goals, and that it was e designed to have inevitably dire consequences for the non-combatants in Gaza. The disproportionate destruction and violence against civilians sprang from a deliberate policy, as did the humiliation and dehumanization of the Palestinian population. Although Israel justified the attack on grounds of self-defense against Hamas rocket attacks, the report pointed to a different motive. The primary purpose of the Israeli blockade was to bring about a situation in which the civilian population would find life so intolerable that they would leave, if that were possible, or turn Hamas out of office, as well as to collectively punish the civilian population, while caste lead itself was aimed at punishing the Gaza population for its resilience and for its apparent support for Hamas, and possibly with the intent of forcing a change in such support. The report concluded that the Israeli assault constituted a deliberately disproportionate attack designed to punish, humiliate, and terrorize a civilian population, radically diminish its local economic capacity both to work and to provide for itself, and to force upon it an ever-increasing sense of dependency and vulnerability. It also paid tribute to the resilience and dignity of the Gazan people in the face of dire circumstances. In its legal determinations, the Goldstone Report found that Israel had committed numerous violations of customary and conventional international law. It also ticked off a considerable list of war crimes committed by Israel, including willful killing, torture or inhuman treatment, willfully causing great suffering or serious injury to body or health extensive destruction of property, not justified by military necessity and carried out unlawfully and wantonly, and use of human shields. It further determined that Israeli actions that deprive Palestinians in the Gaza Strip of their means of sustenance, employment, housing, and water, that deny their freedom of movement and their right to leave and enter their own country that limit their access to courts of law and effective remedies, might justify a competent court finding that crimes against humanity have been committed. 
The report pinned primary culpability for these criminal offenses on Israel's political and military elites. The systematic and deliberate nature of the activities leaves the mission in no doubt that responsibility lies in the first place with those who designed, planned, ordered, and oversaw the operations. The report also determined that the fatalities, property damage, and psychological trauma resulting from Hamas's indiscriminate and deliberate rocket attacks on Israel's civilian population constituted war crimes and may amount to crimes against humanity. A charge of bias was leveled against the report because only a small fraction of it was devoted to Hamas rocket attacks. The accusation of bias was valid, but the bias ran in the reverse direction. If the ratio of Palestinian to Israeli deaths stood at more than 100 to 1, and of homes destroyed at more than 6, 0, 0, 0 to 1, then the proportion of the report devoted to Hamas's crimes was much greater than the objective data warranted. When it was subsequently put to Goldstone that the report disproportionately focused on Israeli breaches of international law, he replied, it's difficult to deal equally with a state party, with a sophisticated army, with an air force, and a navy, and the most sophisticated weapons that are not only in the arsenal of Israel but manufactured and exported by Israel, on the one hand, with Hamas using really improvised, imprecise armaments. The Goldstone Report did not limit itself strictly to cast lead. It broadened out into a comprehensive, full-blown indictment of Israel's treatment of Palestinians during the long years of occupation. The report condemned Israel's fragmentation of the Palestinian people, and its restrictions on Palestinian freedom of movement, its institutionalized discrimination against Palestinians both in the occupied Palestinian territories and in Israel, its violent repression of Palestinian, as well as Israeli, demonstrators opposing the occupation, and the violent attacks on Palestinian civilians in the West Bank by Israeli soldiers and Jewish settlers enjoying legal impunity, its wholesale detention, torture, and ill-treatment of Palestinians, including hundreds of children, and the lack of due process, its silent transfer of Palestinians in East Jerusalem in order to ethnically cleanse it, its de facto annexation of 10% of the West Bank on the Israeli side of the wall, which amount s to the acquisition of territory by force, contrary to the Charter of the United Nations, and its settlement expansion, land expropriation, and demolition of Palestinian homes and villages. The report determined that certain of these policies constituted war crimes and also violated the Palestinians' fundamental, just Kogan's, right to self-determination. Although it didn't draw a bright-line distinction between the perpetrators and victims of a brutal occupation, the report did eschew, equating the position of Israel as the occupying power with that of the occupied Palestinian population or entities, representing it. The differences with regard to the power and capacity to inflict harm or to protect, including by securing justice when violations occur, are obvious. The Goldstone Report proposed several remedies to hold Israel and Hamas accountable for their respective breaches of international law. Individual states in the international community were exhorted to start criminal investigations in national courts using universal jurisdiction, where there is sufficient evidence of the commission of grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions of 1949. Where so warranted following investigation, alleged perpetrators should be arrested and prosecuted in accordance with internationally recognized standards of justice. It also called on the UN Security Council to monitor the readiness of Israel and Hamas to launch appropriate investigations that are independent and in conformity with international standards into the serious violations of international humanitarian and international human rights law. 
Should either party fail to undertake good-faith investigations, the report urged that the Security Council refer the situation in Gaza to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. It also recommended that Israel pay compensation for damages through a UN General Assembly escrow fund. More broadly, the report recommended that the high contracting parties to the Fourth Geneva Convention enforce the convention and ensure its respect in the occupied Palestinian territories. It also called on Israel to immediately terminate its blockade of Gaza and strangulation of Gaza's economy, its violence against Palestinian civilians, its destruction and affronts on human dignity, its impingement on Palestinian political life and repression of political dissent, and its restrictions on freedom of movement. The report reciprocally called on Hamas to renounce attacks on Israeli civilians and civilian objects, release the Israeli soldier, Gilad Shalit, held in captivity, release political detainees, and respect human rights. The Israeli reaction to the Goldstone report came fast and furious. Apart from a few honorable, if predictable, exceptions, it was subjected for months to a torrent of abuse across the Israeli political spectrum and at all levels of society. Indeed, it was almost impossible to locate the actual report on the web amid the avalanche of vicious attacks. After dismissing the report as a mockery of history and Goldstone himself as a small man, devoid of any sense of justice, a technocrat with no real understanding of jurisprudence, Israeli President Shimon Peres proceeded to set the record straight. IDF, Israel Defense Forces, operations enabled economic prosperity in the West Bank, relieved southern Lebanese citizens from the terror of Hezbollah, and have enabled Gazans to have normal lives again. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu purported that the report was a kangaroo court against Israel while Defense Minister Ehud Barak inveighed that it was a lie, distorted, biased and supports terror. Netanyahu subsequently proposed an initiative to amend the rules of war in order to facilitate the battle against terrorists in the future. What is it that Israel wants? Israeli historian Ziv Sternhell shot back. Permission to fearlessly attack defenseless population centers with planes, tanks, and artillery? Knesset Speaker Reuven Rivlin warned that the report's new and crooked morality will usher in a new era in Western civilization, similar to the one that we remember from the 1938 Munich Agreement. Before the hate fest was over, almost every prominent political figure in and out of office had chimed in. Former Foreign Minister C.P. Livni declared that the Goldstone Report was a born in sin. Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman declared that it had no legal, factual or moral value. And Deputy Foreign Minister Danny Ayalon warned that it provides legitimacy to terrorism and risks, turning international law into a circus. Dan Gil Lehrman, former Israeli ambassador to the United Nations, ripped the report for blatant, one-sided, anti-Israel lies, and Dor Gold, former Israeli ambassador to the United Nations, derided it as one of the most potent weapons in the arsenal of international terrorist organizations, while Gabriela Shalev, Israeli ambassador to the United Nations, castigated it as biased, one-sided, and political. Michael Oren, Israeli ambassador to the United States, won the Triple Crown for venomous spewings. He alleged in an address to the American Jewish Committee that Hezbollah was one of the report's principal beneficiaries, intoned in the Boston Globe that the report must be rebuffed by all those who care about peace, and reckoned in the New Republic that the report was even worse than Iranian President Mahmoud, Ahmadinejad and the Holocaust deniers. IDF Chief of Staff Gabi Ashkenazi ridiculed the report as biased and unbalanced, while IDF senior legal adviser Avichai Mendelblit mocked it as a biased, astonishingly extreme, 
lacking any basis in reality. Non-governmental institutions and public figures also weighed in. The Jerusalem Post editorialized that the report was a feat of cynical superficiality, and was born in bias and matured into a full-fledged miscarriage of justice. Former Haaretz editor-in-chief David Landau lamented that the report's fundamental premise, that the Israelis went after civilians, eliminated any possibility of honest debate. Far from its premise, that was the report's conclusion after scrutinizing mountains of evidence. Israel Harel, a leader of the settler movement, scoffed at the report as destructive, toxic, even worse than the protocols of the elders of Zion, and misdirected, against precisely that country which protects human and military ethics more than the world has ever seen. Residents of an Israeli town abutting Gaza picketed UN offices in Jerusalem with placards declaring, Goldstone apologize, and, we're sick of anti-Semites. A Tel Aviv University Center for the Study of Antisemitism and Racism purported that the report was responsible for a global surge in hate crimes against Jews and the equation of the war in Gaza with the Holocaust. Alleging that Goldstone's accusations against Israel echoed those leveled against Alfred Dreyfus, Professor Gerald Steinberg of Bar Elon University declared that Israel had the moral right to flatten all of Gaza. Steinberg founded the university's program on conflict resolution and management. Fully 94% of those Israeli Jews familiar with the report held it to be biased against Israel, and 79% rejected its accusation that the IDF committed war crimes. Even after caste lead and the ensuing lies and cover-ups by the military, Fully 90% of Israeli Jews ranked the IDF as the state institution they most trusted. Inasmuch as the report's findings were beyond the pale, the only issue deemed worthy of public deliberation in Israel was whether or not Israel should have cooperated with the Goldstone mission. But as veteran peace activist Yuri Avnery pointed out, the real answer, why Israel chose not to cooperate, is quite simple. They knew full well that the mission, any mission, would have to reach the conclusions it did reach. In a telling departure from past histrionics, Israelis dispensed after caste lead with those emotive outpourings of angst, shooting and crying, that cheerleaders abroad used to tout as proof of the uniquely sensitive Jewish soul. Brutalized and calloused, Israelis no longer even bothered to feign remorse. Although calling for a ceasefire after the initial air assault, the icons of Israel's peace camp Amos Oz, A. B. Yehoshua, and David Grossman, still alleged that Hamas was responsible for the unfolding horror, and that the Israeli ground and air attack was necessary because Hamas leaders refused every Israeli and Egyptian attempt to reach a compromise to prevent this latest flare up. In a secondary blast of hot air, the usual suspects in the United States rose, or sunk, to the occasion by lambasting the message and slandering the messenger. Max Boot dismissed the Goldstone Report on Commentary's website as a risible series of findings, while John Bolton, former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, opined in the Wall Street Journal that, the logical response to this debacle is to withdraw from and defund the Human Rights Council. Elie Wiesel condemned the report not only as a crime against the Jewish people, but also as being unnecessary. I can't believe that Israeli soldiers murdered people or shot children. It just can't be. Heading up the domestic witch hunt, Harvard Law School's Alan Dershowitz alleged that the report is so filled with lies, distortions and blood libels that it could have been drafted by Hamas extremists that it echoed the protocols of the elders of Zion and was biased and bigoted, that every serious student of human rights should be appalled at this anti-human rights and highly politicized report, that it made findings of fact, nearly all wrong, stated conclusions of law, nearly all questionable, 
and made specific recommendations, nearly all one-sided, that Goldstone himself was a traitor to the Jewish people, an evil, evil man, and, he proclaimed on Israeli television, on a par with Auschwitz, angel of death, Joseph Mengel. The essence and central conclusion of the report, according to Dershowitz, was that Israel had a carefully planned and executed policy of deliberately targeting innocent civilians for mass murder. Israel's real purpose was to target innocent Palestinian civilians, children, women, and the elderly for death. He repeated this characterization of the report on nearly every page often multiple times on a single page, of his lengthy study in evidentiary bias, and then proceeded to handily refute the accusation. But Dershowitz conjured a straw man. The report never stated or suggested that the principal objective of caste lead was to murder Palestinians. Otherwise, it would have had to charge Israel with genocide. It is a commonplace that the more frequently a lie is repeated the more credible it becomes. The novelty of Dershowitz's study was that it kept repeating a falsehood the more easily to discredit its alleged purveyor. Goldstone bashers in the United States also claimed that Hamas had coached and intimidated Palestinian witnesses, disguised its militants as witnesses, and fed Goldstone uncorroborated information. However, none of these detractors adduced a shred of evidence, while Goldstone himself rejoined by offering every assurance that it didn't happen. Communal Jewish organizations predictably joined in the gang up. The American Israel Public Affairs Committee, APAC, called the Goldstone mission rigged and the report deeply flawed. The American Jewish Committee deplored it as a deeply distorted document. Abraham Foxman of the Anti-Defamation League was shocked and distressed that the United States would not unilaterally dismiss it. The Obama administration quickly fell into lockstep with the Israel lobby. However, it probably did not need much prodding. One of Israel's talking points in Washington was that the Goldstone Report's recommendation to prosecute soldiers for war crimes should worry every country fighting terror. State Department spokesman Ian Kelly alleged that whereas the report makes overly sweeping conclusions of fact and law with respect to Israel, its conclusions regarding Hamas's deplorable conduct are more general. Assistant U.S. Secretary of State for Democracy Michael Posner condemned it as a deeply flawed and Deputy U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Alejandro Wolf faulted its unbalanced focus on Israel. In its 47-page entry for Israel and the Occupied Territories, the U.S. State Department's 2009 Human Rights Report devoted all of three sentences to cast lead, then touched on the report's findings and disparagingly concluded. The Goldstone Report was widely criticized for methodological failings, legal and factual errors, falsehoods, and for devoting insufficient attention to the asymmetrical nature of the conflict and the fact that Hamas and other Palestinian militants were deliberately operating in heavily populated urban areas of Gaza. Congressman Gary Ackerman, chair of the House Subcommittee on the Middle East and South Asia, mocked Goldstone as inhabiting a self-righteous fantasy land, and the report as a pompous, tendentious, one-sided political diatribe. The probability that any of these critics actually read the report approaches zero. After mutely absorbing this relentless barrage of attacks, Goldstone finally dared the Obama administration to substantively justify its criticisms. Meanwhile, Human Rights Watch, HRW, took to task the U.S. government for calling the report unbalanced and deeply flawed, but providing no real facts to support those assertions. The U.S. House of Representatives passed by a vote of 344 to 36 a non-binding resolution that condemned the report as irredeemably biased and unworthy of further consideration or legitimacy. 
before the vote was taken. Goldstone submitted a point-by-point -point rebuttal demonstrating that the House resolution was vitiated by serious factual inaccuracies and instances where information and statements are taken grossly out of context. The Obama administration worked behind the scenes in concert with Israel to foreclose consideration of the report in international forums, and privately gloated at the successes it had scored. Hillary Clinton later bragged that while Secretary of State in the Obama administration, she had defended Israel from isolation and attacks at the United Nations and other international settings, including opposing the biased Goldstone report. Pressure was also exerted on the Palestinian Authority, PA, to drop its support of the report's recommendations. The PA has reached the point where it has to decide a senior Israeli defense official declared, whether it is working with us or against us. The answer was not long in coming. Acting at the behest of President Mahmoud Abbas, the PA representative on the UN Human Rights Council effectively acquiesced in killing consideration of the report. His decision provoked such outrage among Palestinians, however, that the PA had to reverse itself and the Council convened to deliberate on the report. It approved a resolution, condemning all targeting of civilians, and stressing the urgent need to ensure accountability for all violations of international law, endorsed the report's recommendations, and urged the United Nations to act on them. In November 2009, the UN General Assembly passed by a vote of 114 to 18. 44 abstentions, a resolution, condemning all targeting of civilians and civilian infrastructure, and calling on both Israel and Hamas to undertake investigations that are independent, credible and in conformity with international standards into the serious violations of international law, reported by the fact-finding mission. Denouncing the resolution as completely detached from realities, and a mockery of reality, Israel proclaimed that the vote proves that Israel is succeeding in getting across the message that the report is one-sided and not serious, and that the Democratic Premier League estates voted in line with Israel's position, among them, the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, and Palau. In February 2010, UN Secretary General Ban Ki moon reported back to the General Assembly that still no determination can be made on the implementation of its November 2009 resolution calling for credible investigations. Later that month, the General Assembly passed another resolution by a vote of 98 to 7, 31 abstentions, reiterating its call on Israel and Hamas to conduct investigations that are independent, credible and in conformity with international standards, and requesting that the Secretary-General report back within five months on the implementation of the resolution. Despite intensive lobbying by European Jewish groups, in March 2010 the European Parliament passed. 335 to 287, a resolution demanding implementation of the report's recommendations and accountability for all violations of international law, including alleged war crimes. The spokesman for the Israeli mission to the European Union deplored the resolution as flawed and counterproductive. In January and July 2010, Israel released updates on its own investigations. Although the pair of updates indicated that scores of investigations had been conducted, the results overwhelmingly exonerated Israelis of wrongdoing. A handful of soldiers suffered disciplinary sanctions, such as an officer who was severely reprimanded. The harshest sentence meted out was a seven-and-a-half-month prison term to a soldier who had stolen a credit card. Still, even these token punishments caused the IDF to inveigh against the shackles allegedly being placed on it. The Israeli investigations could not, however, be faulted for lack of creativity. 
One soldier who killed a woman carrying a white flag was exonerated on the grounds that the bullet was actually a warning shot that ricocheted off a cloud. Despite its vindication by these investigations, Israel magnanimously adopted important new written procedures and doctrine designed to enhance the protection of civilians and to limit unnecessary damage to civilian property and infrastructure in future conflicts. The tacit conceit was that if Israel bore a small measure of responsibility for the death and destruction in Gaza, it had resulted from operational deficits, and not, as the Goldstone Report concluded, from an assault designed to punish, humiliate and terrorize a civilian population. After the first update, Haaretz editorialized that the Israeli investigations were not persuasive that enough has been done to reach the truth. But in a subsequent editorial, it validated the second round of investigations and implied that it was time to close the book on the report. Both Amnesty and HRW wholly dismissed the first round of Israeli investigations, while HRW stated after the second update that although some results had been achieved, the Israeli investigations still fall far short of addressing the widespread and serious allegations of unlawful conduct during the fighting. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights announced in June 2010 the formation of an independent committee to ensure accountability for all violations of international humanitarian and international human rights laws during the Gaza conflict. The committee's report, issued in September 2010, found that whereas certain positive steps have resulted from Israel's investigations, the bottom line was that the military investigations thus far appear to have produced very little. Indeed, while the committee cannot conclude that credible and genuine investigations have been carried out by the de facto authorities in the Gaza Strip, at the time of the report's issuance, Hamas had apparently convicted and sentenced to prison time more individuals than Israel. After release of the committee's report, Amnesty urged the UN Human Rights Council to recognize the failure of the investigations conducted by Israel and the Hamas de facto administration, and to call on the ICC, International Criminal Court, prosecutor urgently to seek a determination whether the ICC has jurisdiction over the Gaza conflict. In March 2010, the semi-official Israeli Intelligence and Terrorism Information Center, ITIC, released a voluminous response to the Goldstone Report. It was based largely on interrogations of terrorist operatives, reports from IDF forces, Israeli intelligence information, and unverifiable and indecipherable photographic evidence. Ignoring copious evidence amassed by human rights organizations, the ITIC publication denied that Gaza was facing a humanitarian crisis before cast lead. It blamed Hamas for the shortages that did arise. It denied that Israel's November 4, 2008, raid on Gaza caused the breakdown of the ceasefire with Hamas, and it denied that Israel used Gazans as human shields. In addition, it falsely alleged that the Goldstone report made almost no mention of the brutal means of repression used by Hamas against its opponents. It falsely alleged that the report devoted just three paragraphs to Hamas's rocket and mortar fire during Operation Cast Lead, and downplayed Israeli civilian deaths. It falsely alleged that the report absolved Hamas of all responsibility for war crimes. It falsely alleged that the report gave a superficial treatment to the terrorist organizations' use of civilians as human shields, and it falsely alleged that the report depended on the unreliable casualty statistics provided by Hamas. On more than one occasion, the ITIC publication tested the limits of chutzpah and credulity. It rebuked not Israel but Hamas for unwillingness to cooperate with the Goldstone mission, and it purported that 
Hamas operatives would position innocent civilians near IDF tanks to prevent IDF soldiers from shooting at them. In other words, Hamas dragged Palestinian civilians to Israeli tank positions, ordered them to stay put, and then beat a swift retreat. It is not revealed whether the civilians did stay put. It might be cause for perplexity why the Goldstone report provoked so much vituperation in Israel and set in motion a diplomatic blitz to contain the fallout. It was, after all, just one of hundreds of human rights reports condemning caste lead. Its findings did not measurably differ from the others, and Israel had never paid heed to UN bodies. The answer, however, was not hard to find. Goldstone was not only Jewish but also a self-declared Zionist, who worked for Israel all of my adult life, fully supports Israel's right to exist, and was a firm believer in the absolute right of the Jewish people to have their home there. He headed up a Jewish organization that managed vocational schools in Israel, and he sat on the board of governors of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem from which he had received an honorary doctorate. His mother was an activist in the women's branch of the Zionist movement, while his daughter had emigrated to Israel and was an ardent Zionist. Goldstone had also singled out the Nazi Holocaust as the seminal inspiration for the international law and human rights agenda of which he was a leading exponent. In light of his Jewish-slash-Zionist bona fides, Israel could not credibly play its usual cards, anti-Semite, self-hating Jew, Holocaust denier, against Goldstone. In effect, his persona neutralized the ideological weapons Israel had honed over many decades to ward off criticism. This time, in Gideon Levy's telling phrase, the messenger is propaganda proof. To be sure, some desperados did try to discredit Goldstone as an anti-Semite, Israeli finance minister Yuval Steinitz, and the report as partially motivated by anti-Semitic views of Israel, philosophy professor Asa Kasher, and the type of anti-Semitism that led to the Holocaust, Israeli information minister Yuli Edelstein. A Google search for the words Goldstone anti-Semite Gaza one week after the report's publication brought up over 75,000 websites. Still, the slanders collapsed under the weight of their manifest absurdity. Goldstone's detractors then speculated that the report was a product of Goldstone's overweening ambition. He was said to be angling for a Nobel Peace Prize or to head the United Nations. But Goldstone's impeccable reputation easily withstood these imputations of opportunism. However, in interviews and statements after the report was published, and as a harbinger of things to come, Goldstone did appear to backpedal from its more damning conclusions and to downplay the extent of Israeli crimes. It was then alleged that Goldstone had been suckered into lending his good name to a half baked report. But the chief prosecutor in multiple international war crimes tribunals was plainly nobody's dupe. If Goldstone was not an anti-Semite, a self-hating Jew, or a Holocaust denier, if he had never evinced animus toward Israel but, on the contrary, had manifested an abiding affection for it, if he was reputed to be a man of integrity, who put truth and justice above self-aggrandizement and partisanship, if he was neither an incompetent nor a fool, if Goldstone could credibly claim all this and more, then the only plausible explanation for the devastating content of the document he chiefly authored was that it faithfully recorded the damning facts as they unfolded during cast lead. The only thing they can be afraid of, Goldstone later observed of his detractors, is the truth. And I think this is why they're attacking the messenger and not the message. Compelled to face the facts and their consequences, disarmed and exposed, Israel went into panic mode. Israeli pundits expressed alarm that the report might impede Israel's ability to launch military attacks in the future, 
while Prime Minister Netanyahu ranked the Goldstone threat one of the major strategic challenges confronting Israel. In the meantime, Israeli officials fretted that prosecutors might hound Israelis traveling abroad. Indeed, shortly after the report was published, the ICC announced that it was contemplating an investigation of an Israeli officer implicated in war crimes during caste lead. Then, in December 2009, C.B. Livni was forced to cancel a trip to London after a British court issued an arrest warrant for her role in the commission of war crimes while serving as foreign minister during caste lead. And in June 2010, two Belgian lawyers representing a group of Palestinians charged 14 Israeli politicians, including Livni and Ehud Barak with committing crimes against humanity and war crimes during the attack. Unable to exorcise his ghost, Goldstone's assailants escalated the meanness of their ad hominem attacks. South African communal Jewish leaders plotted to bar Goldstone from attending his grandson's bar mitzvah, but after a wave of embarrassing publicity abroad they reversed themselves. Goldstone's judicial tenure under apartheid rule in South Africa was then dredged up by Israel and dutifully disseminated in the American media by hack journalists, such as Jeffrey Goldberg, in Atlantic Magazine, and Jonathan Chait, in The New Republic. Goldstone was tagged a hanging judge for his blemished record of service with an entirely illegitimate and barbaric regime, Dershowitz. But as Sasha Polakowshurinsky, a senior editor at Foreign Affairs magazine and the author of The Unspoken Alliance, Israel's secret relationship with apartheid South Africa, pointed out, by serving as South Africa's primary and most reliable arms supplier during a period of violent internal repression and external aggression, Israel's government did far more to aid the apartheid regime than Goldstone ever did. Indeed, just as South African repression of the black majority peaked, Defense Minister Shimon Peres confided to its leadership that Israeli cooperation with the apartheid regime was based not only on common interests, but also on the unshakable foundations of our common hatred of injustice, and Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin toasted the ideals shared by Israel and South Africa, the hopes for justice and peaceful coexistence. While sanctimoniously denouncing apartheid in public, Perez had forged and then nurtured at critical junctures the Israeli alliance with South Africa, and both he and Rabin supported this collaboration right through the last years of the apartheid regime. In last desperate gambits to crucify Goldstone, the Hebrew University's Board of Governors ousted him, and former APAC executive director Neil Schur urged American officials to bar former Judge Richard Goldstone from entering the country over his rulings during South Africa's apartheid regime. The moral case Sher mounted was somewhat tainted, however, by the fact that he himself had been disbarred after squandering Holocaust compensation monies on his vacation sprees. The symbolism, indeed pathos, of Goldstone's charge sheet against Israel was hard to miss. A lover of Zion was now calling for Zion to be hauled before the ICC for an array of war crimes and possible crimes against humanity. In effect, Goldstone's entry on the stage of the Israel-Palestine conflict signaled the implosion of that unstable alloy, some would say oxymoron, called liberal Zionism. On the one hand, he was the quintessential liberal Jew, a revered defender of the rule of law and human rights. On the other hand, he had nurtured a profound bond with Israel. Goldstone was now compelled by the circumstance of his appointment to make a choice. Even if disposed by family and faith to do so, he still could not defend caste lead. His judicial temperament, public reputation, and personal pride stood in his way. He was constrained by the parameters of the law, which if consulted in good conscience could not be stretched beyond certain limits. He functioned within a human rights milieu that had already rendered a devastating verdict on caste lead, 
he could not ignore it and still preserve his credibility in that community. The fact was, he had a choice in theory only. If Goldstone had elected to defend Israel against the indefensible, he would have committed professional suicide and irrevocably soiled his personal reputation. That far in his defense of Israel Goldstone was not prepared to go. In the meanwhile, as Israel struggled to retain the allegiance of the Jewish diaspora, the report's publication threw a new spanner in the works. It had become increasingly difficult for self-described liberal Jews in the diaspora to defend Israel's ever more brazen crimes. Cast lead marked the nadir of Israel's incremental descent into barbarism, or as the report euphemistically put it, the operation signaled a qualitative shift by Israel from relatively focused operations to massive and deliberate destruction. If even a Jew, Zionist, and liberal with Goldstone's immaculate credentials confirmed this shift, how could it be ignored? Jews broadly of Goldstone's temper, which was to say, the overwhelming majority of American Jews, who identify their long-term interests with liberal policies, would hereafter find it well-nigh impossible to brush aside even the harshest criticism of Israel, while Israel's defenders would have a harder time deflecting such criticism. Those groups who unquestioningly attack the report's veracity, a British friend and supporter of Israel, wrote in The Guardian, find themselves further alienated from significant swaths of Jewish opinion, especially among the younger generation. The reaction in the bastions of American Jewish liberalism to the report was as notable for what was not said as for what was said. If newspaper editorials and liberal commentary did not come out in Goldstone's defense, they also did not defend Israel against him. The report appeared to herald the end of one era and the emergence of another, the end of an apologetic Jewish liberalism that denied or extenuated Israel's crimes, and the emergence of a Jewish liberalism that returned to its inspirational heyday, when if only as an ideal imperfectly realized, all malefactors, non-Jews as well as Jews, would be held accountable as they strayed from the path of justice. The vicious personal attacks on Judge Goldstone are profoundly disturbing, Rabbi Brant Rosen observed. What is perhaps more interesting, however, is the fact that so many in the American Jewish community are refusing to join the chorus. American Jews are working to hold Israel to a set of Jewish values that are more important than any political ideology. Even if tempted, diaspora Jews could not bury the Goldstone Report because it had resonated most in the milieus where they worked and socialized. Western governments may ignore this damning report, an Israeli commentator prophesied but it will now serve as a basis of criticism against Israel in public opinion, the media, on campuses and in think tanks, places where UN documents are still taken seriously. An Israeli reserve officer who did double duty as an emissary for Israel on U.S. college campuses, lamented that protesting students, quote the Goldstone Report. It's become their Bible. Among Jews professing to be enlightened, it could hardly be a close call choosing between the credibility of Israel's cheerleaders and the likes of Goldstone. Does it then come down to a matter of whose reputation you trust? Antony Lehrman rhetorically asked. If so, would it be critics of human rights agencies like Alan Dershowitz, the prominent American lawyer who thinks torture could be legalized, or Melanie Phillips? a columnist who calls Jewish critics of Israel, Jews for genocide. Or Richard Goldstone, former chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, who is putting his considerable reputation on the line in taking the UNHRC, UN Human Rights Council, assignment. Frankly, I don't think there is a contest. The Goldstone Report also heralded the dawn of a new era in which the human rights dimension of the Israel-Palestine conflict 
moved center stage alongside, and even temporarily displacing, the fatuous peace process. During the first decades of Israel's occupation, advocates of Palestinian human rights perforce leaned on the research and testimony of a handful of courageous, but politically marginal Israelis. Take the case of torture. In recent times, respected human rights organizations and Israeli historians have acknowledged that Israel routinely tortured Palestinian detainees, from the onset of the occupation. However, until the 1990s and despite a wealth of corroborative evidence, progressive opinion treated reports of Israeli torture gingerly and prudently steered clear of the locution torture. When referencing these reports, a sea change set in during the First Intifada, 1987-93, when Palestinians engaged in mass non-violent civil resistance. On the one hand, torture of Palestinian detainees reached epidemic proportions, and on the other, the newly minted Israeli Human Rights Organization Selim. Israeli Information Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories, irrefutably documented Israel's pervasive use of torture. No longer able to turn a blind eye, but also morally and politically shielded by the escutcheon of reputable Israeli groups, the human rights community in the West began to systematically document Israel's egregious practice of torture, and its many other human rights abuses. However, most of these publications just collected dust, as the establishment media scrupulously ignored them and instead feigned despair at ferreting out the truth between Palestinian accusation and Israeli denial. The novelty of the Goldstone Report was that in one stroke it catapulted Israel's human rights record squarely into the court of public opinion, closed the gap between Jewish and Palestinian narratives on Israel's human rights record, and charged with political consequence the damning findings of human rights organizations. The potential political costs having escalated, hysteria over the Goldstone Report unsurprisingly coincided with a vicious campaign in Israel and the United States, to discredit human rights organizations. We are going to dedicate time and manpower to combating these groups the director of policy planning in the Israeli Prime Minister's office declared. For the first time, the director of HRW's Middle East Division rude, the Israeli government is taking an active role in the smearing of human rights groups. These groups and one of their benefactors, New Israel Fund, came under virulent attack in Israel for allegedly providing the data used by the report to blacken Israel's name. A Knesset subcommittee was established to examine the sources of funding of Israel-based human rights groups, and a succession of Knesset bills proposed, respectively, to outlaw NGOs that provided legally incriminating information to foreign bodies, and to compel members of Israeli NGOs to declare their foreign funders at all public functions. An Israel Democracy Institute poll found that half the general public agree with the statement that human and civil rights organizations, like the Association for Civil Rights in Israel and Selim, cause harm to the state, while a Tel Aviv University poll found that nearly 60% of respondents agreed that human rights organizations exposing immoral conduct by Israel should not be allowed to operate freely. Faced with these unsettling headwinds, Israeli human rights groups noticeably trimmed their sails. In its annual report, B'Selem devoted more lines to Palestinian than Israeli breaches of international law during caste lead, devoted twice as much space to Hamas's grave breach, or war crime, of taking Israeli soldier Galad Shalit hostage, as to all Israeli breaches, none of which it denoted as a grave, or a war crime during caste lead, and disputed key findings of the Goldstone Report but adduced no counter-evidence. In a parallel line of attack, the U.S.-based Israel lobby mobilized against what it dubbed lawfare. The term denoted isolating Israel through the language of human rights. 
In other words, Lawfare signaled the outrageous notion that Israel should be held legally accountable for its crimes. Under the auspices of major law schools and professional organizations, pseudo-academic symposia convened on topics such as the Goldstone Report, lawfare and the threat to Israeli and American national security in the age of terrorism, Fordham University School of Law, and lawfare. The Use of the Law as a Weapon of War, New York County Lawyers Association. Incensed by the scandal of the Goldstone Report, one learned opponent of lawfare thusly corrected for its bias. No armies in the history of warfare have devoted greater attention or energy than those of Israel and the United States to distinguishing and protecting civilians in warfare and ensuring that the force they use in armed conflict is proportional to the threat faced. Of course, this rather large claim was presented evidence-free, as in religion, you were either a believer or you weren't. Simultaneously, perennial apologists for the Holy State, such as Alan Dershowitz and Elie Wiesel, orchestrated a witch hunt against HRW. I really hesitate to use words like conspiracy, but there is a feeling that there is an organized campaign, HRW's program director observed. We have been under enormous pressure and tremendous attacks, some of them very personal. HRW founder Robert Bernstein, who had for years muzzled HRW's criticism of Israel from inside the organization, jumped ship and leapt into the fray. After release of the report and in a highly public defection, Bernstein published an op-ed in the New York Times denouncing HRW's allegedly biased reporting on Israel. Alas, the only testimony he could summon forth in Israel's defense was the ubiquitous Colonel Richard Kemp, who lauded Israel for its unparalleled devotion to humanitarian law during caste lead. Bernstein's broadside was followed a half-year later by a gossipy New Republic expose of discontent within HRW, over the group's supposedly anti-Israel tilt. The piece failed to explore the only substantive question prompted by its content, why did pro-Israel wealthy Jewish donors with no expertise in either human rights or the Middle East, a legendary Hollywood mogul, a 48-year-old who formerly worked on Wall Street, a former stockbroker, exercise power and influence over HRW's Middle East division? Regrettably, HRW proved unable to weather the storm of vilification fully intact. Its 2010 World Report stated, for instance, that Reports by news media and a non-governmental organization indicate that in some cases, Palestinian armed groups intentionally hid behind civilians to unlawfully use them as shields to deter Israeli counterattacks. It neglected to mention that neither the fact-finding missions nor human rights organizations, not even HRW itself, found evidence that Palestinian armed groups engaged in human shielding during caste lead. Then, in a transparently desperate gesture to placate the Israel lobby, and while Israel persisted in its inhuman and illegal siege of Gaza's 1.5 million residents, HRW reduced itself to publicly condemning a Jordanian restaurant owner who refused to serve two Israelis a meal. The backpedaling by HRW was symptomatic of the fact that Israel's coordinated and relentless attack on the Goldstone Report had taken its toll. A year after its publication, the report was not yet dead in the water, but some of the wind had been taken out of its sails. After denying any wrongdoing and lashing out at the report, and after the targets of its vilification had been softened, Israel deftly changed tack. It administered a handful of token punishments and, promising to mend its ways, professed that in future wars it would heed the report's lessons. Anxious to rejoin the Israeli consensus, Goldstone's original supporters, such as Haaretz, then claimed vindication and praised Israel's capacity, albeit belated, for self-criticism. 
Defense Minister Barak confidently predicted that he was in the process of dispatching the remnants of the Goldstone Report. Taking his cues from Washington, UN Secretary General Ban Ki moon praised Israel's significant progress investigating allegations of misconduct by the IDF, even though these so called investigations had yielded derisory results. Indeed, its significant progress and substantive reply to the Goldstone Report were showcased in late 2010, when the commander of CAST lead was promoted to IDF Chief of Staff. The UN Human Rights Council continued to defer action on Goldstone's findings as the PA and the Arab League, preferring that the report quietly expire, let it languish in the UN bureaucracy. A September 2010 Human Rights Council resolution, which passed by a vote of 27 in favor, one against, United States, and 19 abstentions, called on its Committee of Independent Experts to submit yet another progress report for the Council's 16th session, in March 2011. The PA and Arab states jointly sponsored this contemptible stalling tactic while the United States voted against it on the grounds that, because Israel had the ability to conduct credible investigations and serious self-scrutiny, further follow-up of the Goldstone Report by United Nations bodies was unnecessary and unwarranted. Palestinian human rights groups denounced the PA for extending impunity to Israeli military and political leaders. An amnesty statement criticized the Council's seriously flawed resolution that fails to establish a clear process for justice and amounts to a betrayal of the victims, and called on the Council to refer the matter to the International Criminal Court for consideration. A representative of Human Rights Watch deemed the resolution a, a step backward, and the start of a slow death of the report. In order to discredit or at least undercut the Goldstone Report, Israel had plunged into the utter depths of its state and society, harnessing and concentrating their full forces, and had simultaneously mobilized the Jewish state's faithful apparatchiks abroad. But although it had managed to take some sting out of the report, Israel was still left dangerously exposed. The devastating accumulation of evidence endured as a standing indictment of its criminal behavior. The report's international resonance still hampered Israel's ability to launch another full-scale attack. The human rights community still needed to be put on notice not to pull another such stunt. Even months after it was published, an Israeli columnist rude, the Goldstone Report still holds the top spot in the bestseller list of Israel's headaches. Chapter 6 The Star Witness Recants On April 1, 2011, Israel's biggest headache went away. Dropping a bombshell on the op-ed page of the Washington Post, Richard Goldstone effectively disowned the devastating UN report of Israeli crimes carrying his name. Israel waxed euphoric. Everything that we said proved to be true, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu gloated. We always said that the IDF, Israel Defense Forces, is a moral army that acted according to international law, Defense Minister Ehud Barak declared. We had no doubt that the truth would come out eventually, Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman proclaimed. The Obama administration used the occasion of Goldstone's recantation to reiterate that Israel had not engaged in any war crimes during Operation Cast Lead, while the U.S. Senate unanimously called on the United Nations to rescind the Goldstone Report. In short, Goldstone's recantation was a black day for human rights and a red-letter day for their transgressors. Might had yet again brought right to its knees. Those in search of a silver lining in the cloud parsed Goldstone's words to prove that he did not actually recant. While it might technically be true, such a rhetorical strategy did not wash. Goldstone was a distinguished jurist. He knew how to craft precise language. If he did not want to repudiate the report, 
this wordsmith could simply have written, I am not recanting my original report by which I still stand. He did not say this, or anything like it. He was surely aware exactly how his intervention would be spun, and it was this predictable fallout, not his parsed words, that would be his legacy. The inescapable fact was that he killed the report, and simultaneously lowered the curtain on his own career. In one fell swoop, Goldstone inflicted irreparable damage on the cause of truth and justice and the rule of law. Despite the passage of time, his dashing of hope still rankles as these lines are written. He poisoned Jewish-Palestinian relations, undermined the courageous work of Israeli dissenters, and, most unforgivably, increased the risk of another merciless IDF assault. It did not take long before Israel gave proof to this prediction. There was much speculation on why Goldstone recanted. Was he blackmailed? Did he finally succumb to the relentless hate campaign targeting him? Did he decide to put his tribe ahead of truth? These questions remain open to this day. What can, however, be asserted with certainty is that his stated rationales cannot account for his decision to reverse himself. The gist of Goldstone's recantation was that Israel did not commit war crimes during caste lead, and that it was fully capable on its own of investigating violations of international law that did occur. The critical passage read, Our report found evidence of potential war crimes and, possibly crimes against humanity, by both Israel and Hamas. The allegations of intentionality by Israel were based on the deaths of and injuries to civilians in situations where our fact-finding mission had no evidence on which to draw any other reasonable conclusion. The investigations published by the Israeli military indicate that civilians were not intentionally targeted, as a matter of policy. It was unclear how to interpret this mea culpa. If he was saying that Israel didn't systematically target Gaza's civilian population for murder, his recantation was gratuitous. The report never entertained, let alone leveled, such a charge, which would have been tantamount to accusing Israel of genocide. Basing itself on voluminous evidence, the report did accuse Israel of deliberately deploying disproportionate and indiscriminate force in order to punish, humiliate and terrorize a civilian population. In his recantation, Goldstone did not take exception to the report's evidence substantiating this charge. Indeed, how could he? Senior Israeli officials, informed analysts, and combatants didn't themselves shy away from acknowledging, in fact, more often than not they bragged, that the IDF unleashed insane amounts of firepower, went wild, demonstrated, real hooliganism, carried on like a mad dog, acted lunatic, and crazy, and destroyed everything in its way, during cast lead. The bottom line was, Goldstone either disavowed what he didn't avow in the first place, or disavowed a pivotal conclusion of the report but did not, and could not, dispute the mass of evidence on the basis of which that conclusion was reached. Still, if as Goldstone alleged, Israel's deliberate resort to disproportionate and indiscriminate firepower did not, intentionally target civilians, did it, as he further suggested, qualitatively differ from a deliberate attack on civilians and not rise to a war crime? It is a tenet of law that, the doer of an act must be taken to have intended its natural and foreseeable consequences. If an indiscriminate, disproportionate attack inevitably and predictably results in the injury and death of civilians, then it is legally indistinguishable from a deliberate attack on them. There is no genuine difference between a premeditated attack against civilians and a reckless disregard of the principle of distinction, according to Yoram Dinstein, Israel's leading authority on international law, they are equally forbidden. If Goldstone was contending that Israel's insane, 
firepower during caste lead did not constitute a war crime because it did not intentionally target civilians, and that it was not criminal behavior for an invading army to go a wild, demonstrate real hooliganism, carry on like a mad dog, act lunatic and crazy, and destroy everything in its way. If he truly believed this, then he needed to brush up on the law, in fact, he had no business practicing law. An indiscriminate, disproportionate attack on civilian areas is in and of itself a war crime, and no less criminal than a deliberately targeted attack. To absolve Israel of criminal culpability, Goldstone revisited the single most notorious incident during caste lead, in which at least 21 members of the al Samuni family perished. The Goldstone report found that Israel had launched a deliberate attack on civilians. In his recantation, however, Goldstone credited media stories of an Israeli investigation that attributed the deaths to a misread drone image. It happened that Goldstone had also commented on this Israeli investigation just a couple of months earlier at Stanford University. In addition, Amnesty International and a UN committee that Goldstone himself cited approvingly also presented updated findings on the incident. Table 2 juxtaposes these various testimonies, Goldstone's critical omissions in his recantation are bold-faced. In his recantation, Goldstone excised all the evidence casting doubt on the new Israeli alibi. Whereas at Stanford he judiciously laid out the arguments on both sides and suspended judgment, just two months later he pinned all his faith on second-hand reports of an Israeli investigation that hadn't even been completed. What is more, both Amnesty and the UN Committee contested the plausibility of the new Israeli alibi. Goldstone's tendentious depiction of the facts in his recantation might have been appropriate if he were Israel's defense attorney, but it hardly befitted the head of a mission that was mandated to ferret out the truth. Goldstone justified his volte face on the grounds that, we know a lot more today. It was indeed true that new information on cast lead entered the public record after the release of his report but the vast preponderance of it sustained and even extended the report's findings. Consider these examples. A new clutch of Israeli soldiers refuting official propaganda stepped forward. An officer who served at a brigade headquarters recalled that IDF policy amounted to ensuring literally zero risk to the soldiers, while a combatant remembered a meeting with his brigade commander where it was conveyed if you see any signs of movement at all you shoot. This is essentially the rules of engagement. Although Goldstone could have cited these new testimonies to buttress his report, he opted instead to ignore them. In 2010, Human Rights Watch published a study based on satellite imagery documenting numerous cases, in which Israeli forces caused extensive destruction of homes, factories, farms and greenhouses in areas under IDF control without any evident military purpose. These cases occurred when there was no fighting in these areas, in many cases, the destruction was carried out during the final days of the campaign when an Israeli withdrawal was imminent. Although Goldstone could have cited this new study to buttress his report, he elected instead to ignore it. If he scrupulously ignored all new evidence confirming the report's findings, it was hard to avoid the conclusion that Goldstone's recitation of a lot more information was tainted by partisanship. It was also telling that as new evidence came to light confirming the Goldstone report's findings, Israel's renewed attempts to refute these findings repeatedly fell flat. After publication of the report, Israel responded with a barrage of denials. The most voluminous of these was a 350-page compilation, Hamas and the Terrorist Threat from the Gaza Strip, by the Israeli Intelligence and Terrorism Information Center. But on inspection, it turned out to be a melange of dubious interpretations, 
flagrant misrepresentations, and outright falsehoods. If Israel's most ambitious refutation of the report itself wholly lacked in substance, how did Goldstone manage to unearth a lot more new information that fatally undercut the report? How did he manage to invalidate a document critical of Israel that, try as it may, Israel itself could not invalidate? In fact, the additional information that Goldstone touted did not exactly overwhelm. He gestured to the findings of Israeli military investigations. But what did, we know, today, about these in-camera hearings shrouded in secrecy except what Israel revealed about them? Israel supplied almost no information on which to independently assess the evidence presented or the proceedings' fairness. It was not known how many were complete and how many still ongoing. Even when they resulted in criminal indictments, the investigations were often inaccessible to the public, apart from the indicted soldiers' supporters, and full transcripts were not subsequently made available. The centerpiece of Goldstone's revelatory new information was the drone image in the al Samuni case. The misreading of it, Israel alleged, and Goldstone tentatively concurred, caused an officer to erroneously target an extended family of civilians. If, as humanitarian and human rights organizations declared right after the attack, it was among the gravest e and most shocking incidents during cast lead, and if, as Goldstone himself stated, the attack was the single most serious incident documented in his report, then why didn't Israel hasten to restore its bruised reputation but instead let elapse 22 months before coming forth, with so simple an explanation? In order to defend itself against Goldstone's findings, Israel disseminated numerous aerial photographs taken during cast lead. Why didn't Israel make publicly available this drone image that allegedly exonerated it of criminal culpability in the most egregious incident, haunting it? It was also cause for perplexity why Goldstone credited this Israeli evidence, sight unseen yet ignored other pertinent and highly credible new evidence. After his report's publication, journalist Amira Haas revealed in the pages of Haaretz that a Javadi force set up outposts and bases in at least six houses in the Samuni compound before the attack. Didn't the Javadi commander who ordered the aerial assault check with his soldiers on the ground before unleashing the deadly fire to ascertain that they were out of harm's way? Didn't he ask them to confirm the blurry drone image of men seemingly carrying rocket launchers, and didn't they set him straight? Israel might have been able to provide plausible answers. But Goldstone did not even bother to pose these obvious questions because, we know, today, that it was just a simple mistake. After the release of the Goldstone report, Israeli authorities had a ready-made, if evidence-free, explanation for many of the other documented war crimes as well. They alleged that the Albader flour mill was destroyed, in order to neutralize immediate threats to IDF forces, that the Sawafiri chicken farm had been destroyed, for reasons of military necessity, and that the al Makadma mosque was targeted because Utu terrorist operatives, were, standing near the entrance. Was the staggering evidence of criminality assembled in the report, supplemented by thousands of pages of other human rights reports, all false if Israel said so? When Israel was accused of firing white phosphorus into civilian areas during caste lead, did we also and no, it didn't happen because Israel emphatically denied it. The only other scrap of novel evidence Goldstone adduced in his recantation was a casualty figure belatedly reckoned by a Hamas official. On the basis of this revised death toll, Goldstone observed, the number of Hamas combatants killed during cast lead turned out to be similar to the official Israeli figure. The upshot was that Hamas's number appeared to confirm Israel's contention that combatants not civilians, comprised the majority of Gazans killed. 
but then Goldstone parenthetically noted that Hamas may have reason to inflate its figure. Indeed, firm grounds did exist for doubting the new figure's authenticity. To prove that it defeated Israel on the battlefield, Hamas originally alleged that only 48 of its fighters had been killed. But as the full breadth of Israel's destruction came into relief after its withdrawal, Hamas's boasts of a battlefield victory rang hollow. In the face of accusations that the people of Gaza had shouldered the cost of its reckless decisions, Hamas abruptly upped the figure by several hundred in order to demonstrate that it, too, had suffered major losses. As Goldstone himself put it at Stanford just two months before his recantation, the new Hamas figure was intended to bolster the reputation of Hamas with the people of Gaza. Whereas Goldstone deferred in his recantation to this politically inflated Hamas figure, his report had relied on numbers provided by respected Israeli and Palestinian human rights organizations, each of which independently and meticulously investigated the aggregate and civilian-slash-combatant breakdown of Gazan deaths, belying the Israeli claim that only 300 civilians were killed. These human rights organizations put the figure at some 800 to 1,200, and also convincingly demonstrated that official Israeli figures couldn't be trusted. Even the largely apologetic 2009 Human Rights Report by the U.S. State Department put the number of dead at close to 1,400 Palestinians, including more than 1,000 civilians. But because a politically manipulated Israeli figure chimed with a politically manipulated Hamas figure, Goldstone discarded the much larger figure for Palestinian civilian deaths documented by human rights organizations, and validated by the U.S. State Department. His hope that Hamas would investigate itself after cast lead, Goldstone ruing in his recantation, had been unrealistic. In contrast, he went on to assert that Israel had already carried out investigations transparently and in good faith, to a significant degree, and he was confident these inquiries would eventually bring all lawbreakers to justice. One wonders on what basis he could have formed this optimistic prognosis, none of the available evidence, old or new, vindicated it. Consider, first, Israel's judicial track record prior to cast lead. Some 1,300 Palestinians were killed in the decade following the outbreak of the First Intifada, 1987-97, yet only 19 Israeli soldiers were convicted of homicide, and not one served prison time. Some 2,300 Palestinian civilians were killed during the Second Intifada, 2000-2003. Yet only five Israeli soldiers were held criminally liable for these civilian deaths, and not one was convicted on a murder or manslaughter charge. Between 2006 and 2009, a soldier who killed a Palestinian not taking part in hostilities was, according to B'Selem, Israeli Information Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories, almost never brought to justice for his act. Jewish settlers who committed acts of violence against Palestinians enjoyed comparable impunity. Throughout these decades, human rights organizations repeatedly condemned Israel's use of disproportionate, indiscriminate, and targeted firepower against Palestinian civilians, as well as Israel's failure to prosecute the perpetrators of these crimes. If Goldstone's expectation that Hamas would investigate itself after cast lead was unrealistic, how much more realistic was the hope that Israel would carry out bona fide investigations after cast lead? In fact, Israel's ensuing performance was exactly what one might have predicted. In the course of cast lead, Israel had damaged or destroyed everything in its way, and not in its way including 58,000 homes, 1,500 factories and workshops, 280 schools and kindergartens, electrical, water, and sewage installations, 190 greenhouse complexes, 
80% of agricultural crops, and nearly one-fifth of cultivated land. Whole neighborhoods were laid waste. It also damaged or destroyed 29 ambulances, almost half of Gaza's 122 health facilities, including 15 hospitals and 45 mosques. By the time it withdrew, the IDF had left behind fully 600,000 tons of rubble and 1,400 corpses, 350 of them children. Fact-finding missions as well as respected international, Israeli, and Palestinian human rights organizations all concluded that much of this destruction and death resulted from Israel's commission of war crimes. But the only penalty Israel imposed for unlawful property destruction during caste lead was a disciplinary measure, punishing one soldier. At the time of Goldstone's recantation, the only Israeli soldier who had done jail time served seven and a half months for credit card theft. After his recantation, one other soldier was ordered to serve a 45-day sentence after killing two women waving a white flag. He was convicted of illegal use of weapons. The pitiful results of these judicial proceedings perfectly aligned with Israel's track record. Nonetheless, according to Goldstone, Israel had carried out investigations transparently and in good faith, to a significant degree, and had demonstrated resolve to achieve justice in the few outstanding cases. The fact was, Goldstone was speaking in tongues, or with a forked tongue. Whereas he could barely contain his praise for Israel, Goldstone could barely contain his contempt for Hamas. Its criminal intent goes without saying, its rockets were purposefully and indiscriminately aimed at civilian targets. The Goldstone report had based this finding on a couple of public statements by Hamas leaders, on the one hand, and on Hamas's targeting of civilian areas with its projectiles, on the other. But Israeli officials issued comparably incriminating public statements, while its incomparably more lethal firepower was also purposefully and indiscriminately aimed at civilian targets. Why then did Goldstone indict Hamas for criminal intent in his recantation but absolve Israel of it? In fact, Judging by his report's relevant findings, none of which Goldstone repudiated, the case against Israel was far more compelling. Its bluster notwithstanding, Hamas couldn't more than wishfully target civilian areas with its arsenal of rudimentary projectiles. Only a single Israeli home was partially damaged during cast lead. But if Israel possessed fine grid maps of Gaza and an extremely effective intelligence gathering capacity, if it made extensive use of state of the art precision weaponry, and if 99% of the Israeli Air Force's combat missions hit targets accurately, and if it only once targeted a building erroneously, indeed, if Israel itself attested to these facts, then as the Goldstone report logically concluded, the massive death and destruction Israel inflicted on Gaza must have resulted from deliberate planning and policy decisions throughout the chain of command. Hamas had done nothing, Goldstone recalled in disgust, to investigate the criminal conduct of Gazans during caste lead. How could he not be outraged? Hamas killed three Israeli civilians and rendered one Israeli home unlivable whereas Israel killed as many as 1,200 Gazan civilians and rendered more than 6,000 Gazan homes unlivable. But Hamas had done nothing to prosecute wrongdoers, whereas Israel locked up a soldier for stealing a credit card. Wasn't it blazingly obvious how much more evil Hamas was? He had agreed to chair the fact-finding mission, Goldstone professed, in order to inaugurate a new era of even-handedness, in forums adjudicating the Israel-Palestine conflict. However noble this objective, its realization was prejudiced by the shameless and shameful double standards riddling his recantation. He also claimed credit for numerous lessons learned by Israel and concomitant policy changes, 
including the adoption of new Israel Defense Forces procedures for protecting civilians in cases of urban warfare. Israel delivered a full court press of these lessons learned and procedural changes just a few years later, during Operation Protective Edge, 2014 instead of killing 350 children, it killed 550 children, instead of destroying 6,300 homes, it destroyed 18,000 homes. The one lesson Israel truly learned from the Goldstone Report was that it was never too late to rupture the spine of human rights advocates, and resume its killing spree. Indeed, the singular distinction of Goldstone's recantation was that it renewed Israel's license to kill. Richard Goldstone plainly did not recant because, we know a lot more today. What he presented as new information consisted entirely of unverifiable assertions by parties with vested interests. The fact that he couldn't cite any genuinely new evidence to justify his volte face was the most telling proof that none existed. What, then, happened? Ever since publication of his report, Goldstone had been the object of a relentless smear campaign. He was not, however, the only one who came under attack. The UN Human Rights Council appointed eminent international jurist Christian Tamuschat as chair of a follow-up committee mandated to determine whether Israel and Hamas were conscientiously investigating the report's allegations. Deciding that Tamuschat was insufficiently pliant, Israel's lobby hounded and defamed him until he had no choice but to step down. He was replaced by New York State Judge Mary McGowan Davis, who would later head the UN Human Rights Council fact-finding mission on Operation Protective Edge. In order to neutralize the report's impact, Israel was clearly prepared to pull out all the stops. Many facets of Goldstone's recantation perplexed. Goldstone was reputed to be highly ambitious. Since Israel had already ostracized itself in public opinion by the time Goldstone agreed to head the fact-finding mission, he no doubt felt secure in the knowledge that the assignment would not mar his career, and might even prove to be a boon, as he upheld the rule of law despite the personal cost. Although Goldstone nonetheless came under savage waves of attack right after publication of his report, the tide did eventually begin to turn in his favor. Haritz editorialized that it was time to thank the critics for forcing the IDF to examine itself and amend its procedures. Even if not all of Richard Goldstone's 32 charges were solid and valid, some of them certainly were. The American Jewish magazine Ticken honored Goldstone at a gala 25th anniversary celebration. In South Africa, distinguished personalities, such as Judge Dennis Davis, formerly of the Jewish Board of Deputies, publicly denounced a visit by Harvard Law professor Alan Dershowitz because, among other things, he had grossly misrepresented the judicial record of Judge Richard Goldstone. It was puzzling, then, why an ambitious jurist at the peak of a long and distinguished career would court professional suicide by an erratic public recantation, alienating his colleagues in the human rights community and throwing doubt on his judicial temperament, just as his star was, after a brief waning, on the rise again. Throughout his professional career, Goldstone functioned in bureaucracies and perforce internalized their norms. But in a shocking break with bureaucratic protocol, he dropped his bombshell without first notifying his three colleagues on the fact-finding mission or anyone at the United Nations. If Goldstone did not confide in them beforehand, wasn't it because he couldn't credibly defend, but didn't want to be shaken from, his resolve to recant? If he was apprehensive that his colleagues wouldn't back him, his intuition proved sound. Shortly after publication of his recantation, the three other members of the Goldstone mission, Christine Chinkin, Hina Jelani, and Desmond Travers, issued a joint statement unequivocally affirming the report's original findings, 
We concur in our view that there is no justification for any demand or expectation for reconsideration of the report, as nothing of substance has appeared that would in any way change the context, findings, or conclusions of that report. Goldstone alleged that it was new evidence apropos Israel's deadly assault on the al Samuni family, and the revised Hamas casualty figure, that induced him to reverse himself. But just two months earlier at Stanford University, he had matter-of-factly addressed these very same points without drawing dramatic new conclusions. No other evidence surfaced in the interim. Goldstone also referenced a UN document so that he could issue Israel a clean bill of health on its internal investigations. But this document was much more critical of Israeli investigations than he let on. It was as if Goldstone was desperately clutching at any shred of evidence, however problematic, to justify his predetermined decision to recant. Indeed, he rushed to acquit Israel of criminal culpability in the al Samuni deaths even before the Israeli military had completed its investigation. A few days before submitting his recantation to the Washington Post, Goldstone had submitted another version of it to the New York Times. The Times rejected the submission, apparently because it did not repudiate the report. It was as if Goldstone was being pressed against his will to publicly recant. To avoid tarnishing his reputation and because his heart was not in it, Goldstone initially submitted a wishy-washy recantation to the Times. After the Times rejected it as not newsworthy, and in a race against the clock, he hurriedly slipped in wording that could be construed as a full-blown repudiation, to ensure that the post would run what was now a bombshell. The exertion of outside pressure on Goldstone would explain the slapdash composition, opaque formulations, and overarching murkiness, in which he seemed to be simultaneously recanting and not recanting the report. It would also explain his embarrassing inclusion of irrelevances such as his call on the Human Rights Council to condemn the slaughter of an Israeli settler family, two years after cast lead in an incident unrelated to the Gaza Strip, by unknown perpetrators. The eminent South African jurist John Duggard was a colleague of Goldstone's. He had headed a cognate fact-finding mission that investigated cast lead. The findings of his report, which contained a finer legal analysis, while the Goldstone report was broader in scope, largely overlapped with Goldstone's. It concluded that the purpose of Israel's action was to punish the people of Gaza, and that Israel was responsible for the commission of internationally wrongful acts by reason of the commission of war crimes and crimes against humanity. In a devastating dissection of Goldstone's recantation, Duggard adjudged, there are no new facts that exonerate Israel and that could possibly have led Goldstone to change his mind. What made him change his mind, therefore, remains a closely guarded secret. Although Goldstone's secret will perhaps never be revealed and his recantation has caused irreparable damage. It is still possible by patient reconstruction of the factual record to know the truth about what happened in Gaza. Out of respect for the memory of those who perished during Operation Cast Lead, this truth must be preserved and protected from its assassins.